Hi guys, and welcome to today's lecture. Um, when we're talking about uh, chemicals and chemical reactions and chemistry and all of that good stuff, there is really one compound that just cannot be ignored um, in biology, and that compound is water. So we're going to spend today kind of getting a uh, probably more than you ever wanted in-depth look at the structure and behavior of water and um, how it makes life possible on Earth, because it does. That's the really important thing to remember is water definitely makes life possible on Earth. And so in this section, we're really just focusing on how does it do that? What makes water so intrinsically better than all of the other compounds that are available and that are around? What makes water so special? And so that's really what today is all about. So water makes life possible. Um, that is just totally true. What It's the reason why when we find an artifact of where there might have been water on Mars. Everyone gets so excited, like who cares? There's like this little artifact of water, this where there could have been water in the past. There's not even water now. But it's so exciting because what it means is that there could be life, right? If there's water, as we understand life, if there's water, there could be life. Uh, water makes up to two-thirds of your body weight, which is why I mentioned in the previous video that in biology, we say that ionic bonds are kind of weak because remember the kryptonite of an ionic bond is water. Water can dissolve an ionic bond so easily. And so uh, because we're made two-thirds of our body weight is made up of water, we definitely um, don't see a lot of ionic bonds intact in our body. They definitely separate into ions. So the thing about water is that it does, it has four, your book says three, I used to have it as six, so we're compromising, we're gonna say four, four undeniably incredible properties that water has that make life possible on Earth. And most of these are due to the structure of water. So we're gonna take a second and we're gonna look what is the structure of water? So water is, as you probably know, H2O. That means that we have one oxygen and two hydrogens. So we start with our one oxygen in the center, and it has two covalent bonds, which means that it's sharing, remember sharing, battle to the death. You can look back and watch the other video if you don't remember. Two covalent bonds to two hydrogens. And remember that these hydrogens and the oxygen are locked in a battle to the death for the love, for having, for control over some electrons. And so those electrons are shared within this bond. And what you're going to notice is I am drawing those electrons. They actually share a pair of electrons. I'm drawing those really close to oxygen because at the end of the day, oxygen is stronger. It has a higher electronegativity, really not something for us right now. It's stronger. It's able to attract those electrons to it with more uh, ferocity. It's able to get them to be near the oxygen. In addition, the oxygen has some lone pair electrons on here. Um, really what we're trying to identify for the purposes of our class is that all of this stuff right here makes oxygen kind of negative. This is a partial symbol um, and it means it's, it's partially, it's a sigma, it's partially negative and uh, this partial negative means that it's not totally a negative but it acts negative. It's, it's mostly negative and that also means that our electrons are leaving these hydrogens as partially positive. And I fully understand that at this point, you guys are looking at the screen like, I'm not sure I understand this. I'm gonna keep moving because I think it starts to make more sense as you see where we're going with it, okay? So I have my water molecule with my partially negative oxygen, my partially positive hydrogens, and what happens is, is that another water molecule comes up near it. And as we talked about again in the last um, video, my partially positive hydrogen starts to attract my negatives on my oxygen. So we start to get this attraction between there. And this attraction right here 
is called the hydrogen bond. So these hydrogen bonds are what make water so incredible, what provide for the four, what we call emergent properties, not like an emergency, like they emerge. When you look at water, these four emergent properties show up that you maybe never would have predicted that you would see. Um, based on just the general structure of water. And so we're going to look at these four emergent properties. The first one is two properties. Actually, it's kind of three. I'm kind of cheating. Um, the first one is cohesion and adhesion. And what that's really talking about is the stickiness of this hydrogen bond. When two water molecules are near each other, they stick together and allows um, water molecules to cohesively, cohesion, cohesively stick together and to have adhesion where they adhere to something else, like adhesive tape sticks to you, right? It adheres from the tape to you. So they have cohesion and adhesion, and that allows them to do something like have surface tension. So there's this picture right here of a paper clip floating on a glass of water. And that is an example of the cohesion of the water molecules creating surface tension. We know about surface tension from a belly flop. If you've ever belly flopped in the pool, you know about surface tension. It hurts, right? When you slap the water, it slaps back. Uh, that's the idea of surface tension. And that's really from these water molecules, kind of and all of these accumulation of hydrogen bonds, so many hydrogen bonds, that they actually keep those water molecules together. Now, in addition, the water can stick to the side of a container, and we call that adhesion, and that allows for something like capillary action. Now, capillary action is used in the doctor's office when they do a blood draw. I don't know if you've ever had this done before. My daughter hasn't done all the time. But where they prick your finger, and they put this, it looks like a little straw, and they touch it to the blood, and the blood goes right up into the straw. Okay, uh, That is called capillary action, and capillary action pulls the water along. Um, I like to use the example or I like to visualize um, if you've ever been like kind of moving quickly through a crowded area, whether that's an airport or it's Disneyland or wherever you're going and you don't want to lose each other so you hold hands and so you kind of pull each other along. So as one person goes forward, they're kind of pulling the next person with them, they're, they're pulling them along. And that's really the idea of capillary action. Capillary action is what allows for water, I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, maybe it's a weird thing to think about, but water molecules from the base of a tree go up the tree and out the top of the leaves in transpiration into the environment. And I don't know if you've ever stopped to wonder, how does water flow up? Right? How does the water go up the tree? I've never seen water flow up. If I pour water, I'm always expecting it to flow down. And in this case, we say no, water moves from the roots up to the top of the tree. We learn that as little kids. We accept it as being true, but it doesn't necessarily make sense, right? Unless you consider capillary action. So the properties of cohesion and adhesion allow the water molecules to stick to each other and to stick to the walls of the plant. And they're able then to travel up and out to the top of the plant um, in the process of transpiration. So cohesion and adhesion, it allows for uh, the surface tension of water. It allows then, it helps to allow for oceans. It allows for plants to exist. Like we said, water makes life possible. The second emergent property of water is that it has a high heat capacity. That means that water can absorb a lot of energy and release a lot of energy without changing temperature. Um, this is why on a hot day, like right now when it's so hot outside, the ocean doesn't get excessively hot. The ocean stays cool because it's absorbing all of the heat from the sun and then at night it actually gives off that heat. That's why here, near the beach, okay, if you're near the beach where Bishop is, you'll notice that your days are more temperate. Everything is more um, consistent, daytime and nighttime temperature, lows and highs. Where if you go more inland, right, as you go in, I mean, as simple as going, you know, just inland to the Inland Empire, somewhere like that, you're going to see a lot bigger 
um, hot and cold swings if you go to the valley. Even more so though, if you go to the desert, right? If you keep going inland, you're gonna see that your high and low temperatures get further and further apart because they don't have the oceans to allow. Even more so on Earth in general, our temperatures are kept from doing these huge swings like you hear about on other planets, right? Where they have super freezing cold nights and really, really hot, hot days like Mars. Um, we don't have that kind of swing in our temperatures because we have all of this water that has this really high heat capacity that allows for it to allow, uh, prevent big spikes and drops in temperature, um, in the temperature of the earth, in the temperature of our bodies, and it even allows for something called evaporative cooling um, on these hot, hot days, something I'll tell my daughter to do if she's really, really hot and cranky. I say, you know, go wash your arms. Like if you get your hands wet and you wash, like you just put water on your arms all the way up to your shoulders and then you walk away. As the water evaporates off your skin, the water molecules that are on your skin pull the heat from your body with them as they evaporate away. And so it allows for evaporative cooling. That's like what we do when we sweat. The third really cool thing that water does is it floats. I know that sounds like such a weird thing to care about, but water is really cool when it floats. Um, ice floats in liquid water. That's the part that we're talking about. Um, the really sciencey way to say this is it's less dense as a solid than as a liquid, which means that ice floats. Um, this is so important because without this one truth, in the winter time, the lakes of Minnesota or Michigan or you know the oceans would freeze in certain areas. They would freeze solid. And we know that the ice floats on the top, right, of that pond, and it insulates the water underneath so that you could go ice fishing, so that the plants and animals stay alive. They just kind of stay under the, the ice um, top, the ice cap on it. But if ice sank in liquid water, that top layer would freeze and it would sink down to the bottom, and all of the life in ponds and lakes would perish in the winter and then it would have to reestablish in the summer. Even more so, we would end up with a water isolating, a water insulating level, and we wouldn't be able to even get the whole lake unfrozen in the summer. It would cause all sorts of problems. And it's weird that solid ice floats in liquid water. That is not typical for most compounds. Most solids sink in their own liquid, okay? So like if you had, um, like solid iron and liquid iron, okay? The solid iron should sink in the liquid, not float on the top. But ice floats, solid ice floats, and that's because as it freezes, it maximizes its hydrogen bonds, and so it's gonna spread out just ever so slightly. That's why if you put like a mason jar of water in the freezer and it freezes, it cracks the glass because the hydrogen bonds push apart or if you've ever been going to like a sports practice and you freeze your Gatorade or you freeze your water bottle the night before and then you go to open it, it's like partially thawed, you go to open it and all the water spills out, that's because the water has expanded as it froze, which is why solid ice floats on liquid ice. Fourth and final emergent property that we're gonna talk about for water is that water is the universal solvent. That means that water can dissolve anything because of its negative side and positive side. So this is the one emergent property that's not just hydrogen bonds related. Because of its negative side and its positive side, water is able to orient itself so that it can pick up and carry away any charged or partially charged compound or element. So over here, we see two compounds. We see sodium, or sorry, two ions. Over here, we see two ions, sodium, which has a positive charge because it's lost an electron, and chlorine, which has a negative charge because it's gained an electron. So what happens when we put sodium and chlorine together is that the negative sides are gonna surround the sodium 
and lift it up and away. And the positive sides of water, the hydrogen sides, are gonna grab onto chlorine and lift it up and away. And so because of this, we call water the universal solvent. There is nearly nothing water can't dissolve. The only things that can't dissolve are fats, lipids, um, hydrophobic compounds. And because of that, that's why we can store fat in our body as reserves, right? That's why we use fat as storage. That's also why a plant would use a wax on the outside to protect it from rainwater because wax is hydrophobic. So hydrophobic, down here at the bottom, hydrophobic means water-fearing, they don't like water, and hydrophilic is water-loving. And so if something has even a little bit of a charge, we consider it hydrophilic, water-loving. When something does not have a charge, like a fat, like a lipid, we would call that hydrophobic, and it's gonna try to stay away from water. So those are the four emergent properties of water. So we have solvent properties, less dense as a solid than as a liquid, high heat capacity, which regulates temperature on Earth, and cohesion and adhesion, the four emergent properties due to the structure of water.